Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. It's your girl Kimchi Warrior Princess here. And this channel, we're all about helping you look and feel your best in and out of work. Today I'll be doing something a little bit less aesthetically and appearance focused and a little bit more focused on the internal journey of my career in the Air Force as a cyber or communications officer. And if you're not already subscribed to my channel, you totally should hit that red subscribe link below and hit that bell to get notifications for all my future uploads. All right, so let's get started. So just a quick background, I've been active duty in the Air Force for almost 10 years now and I'll be pinning on Major or 04 sometime in the spring. I need to back up a little bit more though because there's so much more to it than like who I am and how I'm here right now in DC. So before I begin, I just want to give a side note here that everyone's experiences vary so much that this is just my own account and my own views and experience that I've experienced. Well, of course, this is my experience I've experienced. But anyway, I'm just saying that everybody has such a different journey, and this is just mine here. So mine actually begins back in high school um, when I was about 15, 16, 10th, 11th grade, and I was looking at different opportunities. And there are three different ways to commission. So there's the Air Force Academy, Air Force ROTC, and Officer Training School. So um, clearly, when I was in high school, I didn't already have a degree, so OTS was out. So I was looking at Air Force Academy and ROTC. I applied to the Air Force Academy and um, I was accepted and the preparation does begin in high school around 10th, 11th grade. Um, on average, um, at that time, I'd say I had around a 3.8 GPA, actually no, a little higher than that, but on average people who are competitive, they'll have at least a 3.8 GPA, a 1300 SAT score, that's just math and verbal, no writing, and then around a 31 composite ACT score, again, not including writing. Um, and that's pretty similar for our ROTC scholarships as well. And I can say that having been an ROTC instructor at San Diego State University a few years ago as well. Um, so around, if you're around those scores, those are quite typical of um, those who are accepted. I'd say either that or higher. Um, I wouldn't go lower. <laughs> so anyway, um, I went to their first academy and the first day that you show up, um, it's actually quite early on in the summer after you graduate high school. I think mine was June 29th, 2006. And um, you show up and all your high school friends are probably like on a Europe trip at this point, but no, you get to go to basic training in Colorado Springs. So uh, <laughs> you get to the first day, I'll just, uh, wow, I haven't thought about this in so long, but the first day you're handed pretty much a, a huge green duffel bag of stuff and at the same time, your arms are shot up with any immunizations, which you should have received beforehand. I thought I received everything, but somehow I still had like shots in both arms. So both arms were dead while you're bear hugging or holding all of your new belongings and slash only belongings <laughs> besides the clothes that you're currently wearing. Um, also, back in the day, I used to pop my collar, which was not a smart move on the first day of basic training because... It makes you stand out and you do not want to stand out <laughs> okay so uh so anyway man the first day it's just all a blur um i could say you just you get yelled at it none of it's personal really it's just it's there to to train you okay you you get broken down mentally but they build you back up and it's to get everybody at the same baseline so um, it is very challenging physically i say especially for women for upper body strength it is a challenge um so it's always good if you're able to do like a pull-up before you go. Um, that was always a challenge for me. Um, but it's really good because you built such a great bond with like your flight or your classmates at that point. Um, and then towards the end, uh, so you do a few weeks in the dorms and then you go out to Jack's Valley where everybody gets pink eye and, <laughs> and it's, it's an adventure. It's great. I mean, it's terrible, but it's great. And I enjoyed I enjoyed it. I look back and I really enjoyed that time. And I made lifelong friends during that process too. So anyway, um, mid-August, the school year will begin and you earn your rank as an actual cadet and no longer you are a basic cadet in the cadet wing. And the cadet wing has about 4,400 cadets. I think that's still around that range. And then um, school starts and then after a couple weeks, it's parents weekend and your parents or your family may come out. Um, there's usually there's a football game and all that. And then there's the whole school year, <laughs> the whole freshman year at the academy, which I won't get into too much detail, but it's kind of uh, more of the same until you earn your privileges to like wear a backpack or to like 
uh, walk around with your backpack on aimlessly in different directions because until then you only would jog on a straight line and come to attention and greet every single person that walked towards you. So anyhow, after about spring break, or actually right before spring break, there's a, a few days of intense training called recognition. And after that you do earn your privileges back, uh, or you earn your privileges actually as a uh, recognized cadet at that point in the cadet wing. And then you finish out the first year and then you have sophomore year where you are no longer the lowest of the low. <laughs> so anyhow, um, during spring semester at the academy, I decided that this no longer was for me, but I still did want to serve, so I moved on to Air Force ROTC, um, and I went to Sacramento State University, and I commissioned in 2011. And one thing to note, between the sophomore and junior summer of ROTC, you do field training, which is a very condensed sort of training. It differs from Air Force Academy basic training in the way that you are not um, being told as much exactly what to do, but you are given the same expectations and you're expected more to lead versus, uh, I don't know, you're just expected more to lead than I'd say during uh, Air Force Academy basic training where you are just doing everything that you're told. So it's a different way of achieving the same goal in a sense. So anyway, um, during uh, during the spring of junior year at ROTC, I did put in my preferences for uh, Air Force specialty codes or the job that you want. And during that time, communications was, it was an option, but it didn't, I didn't put it as an option on my choices. Um, and cyber did not exist at that time until about 2010, I want to say. But um, I think my choices that I put were uh, acquisitions, what else, Intel, public affairs, uh, for support or personnel and then um, something else, something random, say airfield operations or something like that. So I didn't even choose communications or cyber, but it somehow selected me. <laughs> so I was uh, given cyber at the time of graduation and I left and went to Biloxi, Mississippi, which had Keesler Air Force Base. Um, so just to break down for you right now, the cyber career field has split up again into four different uh, micro, I guess not micro career fields, just four different career fields within cyber. So the first one is network operations and they manage the entire base network at essentially every single Air Force base or a base where there's an Air Force presence, so that's me. Uh, the second one would be combat communications, so that's setting up bare bone networks in more austere remote locations. Um, the third one would be uh, offensive cyber operations, so essentially those are your hackers. And then the fourth one is defensive cyber operations, so that's preventing the Air Force from being hacked. So there you go, there, those are the four different career fields that we have. So the Air Force Tech School for Cyber Officers is undergraduate cyber training. However, um, I do believe they're always revamping it and changing it, so please keep that in mind that it does fluctuate and change. <laughs> um, so when I went through though, they taught everybody the basics, like a little bit of everything, and it lasted six months, although technically I was there for about eight and a half, just due to holiday time that kind of drags it out. Um, but they teach you the basics, so they teach you like Network Fundamentals, Security Plus, the CompTIA certification, um, even like Cyber Law and Ethics, Cyber Surety, <laughs> and they do teach you offensive cyber operations and defensive operations and the basics of all these and how to hack. And I've never actually hacked anyone once in my career, um, except for like my family, just for fun. It's kind of neat though to at least know the basics of it. So the day to day while you're in cyber school, um, it kind of starts super early. So it started either at 6 or 6.30 in the morning and it would end at around 15.30 um, in the afternoon and then there would be PT like twice a week. Um, that's the typical schedule. Although those were the hours, I actually spent way more hours uh, in the classroom after class was technically over learning all of this just because my baseline understanding of IT or cyber or communications was literally zero and I was in classes full of say computer science majors or anything like that. I studied political science, so literally I knew nothing about computers, so I had to compensate for it with my own time and effort um, asking teachers questions, uh, like literally starting from zero, and I felt ridiculous asking them some things, however, 
I think they saw my initiative and literally it is their job to answer the question. So if they can't answer it, then you cannot be held accountable for not knowing it. So I would literally ask everything just because I wanted to know what the heck is this all about that I'm going to be expected to not only know, but actually lead people in this field. So something that could get you a little bit ahead of the game if you were to go would be to get your Security Plus certification beforehand. Um, there's a book by Daryl Gibson that his was the best that I found. Um, it was just the generic book. It won't necessarily put you much ahead of the game because either way you're going to get that certification one way or the other. I don't know though with these four different career fields now that we're split if they're going to just completely split off the schoolhouse or not. I haven't been up to date in, on that yet. But about two thirds of the way through your cyber school, there'll be an assignment process to get you selected for your first actual assignment. And for us, uh, at that time, they had like a list of available uh, assignments. And then we have like about around 12 to 13 students per class. And then the instructors would do their best to match up along with the assignments team of who should go where at that point. And typically the number one guy or ga gal, girl, <laughs> they'll get the most challenging or you know, awesome assignment at that point, and it'll kind of go down the list from there. So I got Shriver Air Force Base, which is Colorado Springs, Colorado, technically, although it's a little bit outside of the Springs, I would say. It's more like Kansas. So the day-to-day -day there can vary, again, super widely from base to base, wherever you are and what assignment you have. So I was in the base communication squadron in the operations flight, and um, typically the flow of the day <laughs> starts at, say, around 0730. You show up, you kind of get settled in, people check their email. I don't do that, actually. I do write down, like, the three goals I have for that day. And then I will typically scan my email, though, for VIP kind of emails and address those as quickly as possible. And then I'll work on the first goal. <clears throat> and then um, I'll start the second. And then I'll go to my inbox and do... Uh, kind of like quick response sort of emails and then anything that I can quickly resolve or answer like that and then I'll go back finish my second task and then I'll start like the third one and then I'll need a break for sure by this point so either do coffee or lunch or something walk around and then I'll come back finish up things like loose ends and stuff like that and then at that point um, you'll typically you may have PT like twice a week depending where you're at so you go to that and then after that you'll leave and go home so different bases and s different places that you're at will have different times, um, but mostly around like 1630, 1700, people are kind of like shut down, closed for the day at that point. So if you're on a shift or a crew or you're assigned to one, your daily life can be completely different than this and your schedule can be totally different as well. Um, or if you're at the Pentagon where I was before, um, I feel like Pentagon was a little bit later. People would start around like, well, it, also each office is different too. So mine didn't start to like eight and people like left later, like five, but then there are people who live way out in middle of nowhere, Maryland or Virginia, and they would come at like six and then leave at two. So a lot of these things, you kind of work them out with your supervisor. And before you start, when you initially meet with them, um, you just kind of, they set expectations with you and you should do that as well with the people who uh, you are their superior as well. So some pros and cons with this career field. Some pros would be you can literally be stationed at almost any base in the world, um, which also that can be a con too, <laughs> depending where you end up. Um, obviously, I've had the opportunity to travel so much um, and I think that that is such a huge pro and it's really enriched my life completely. And I think that's kind of with the Air Force or the military in general, you do travel much more than um, all, the, all of your other friends who are not in the military. Education's another huge pro. Um, the Air Force did help with my undergrad, but I would say that it helped even more, I guess. Well, it did help also with getting my MBA. It, it paid for about 40% of it. I did it through Mississippi State University, um, and that was awesome. Also certifications, so um, if this career field is awesome for certification, so you can really do a good job to set yourself up for later when you either retire or separate too. Also, there's a lot of unique assignments and opportunities that you can do while you're in the communications or cyber career fields as well. And there's certain things like I can't say a whole lot on here, but <laughs> once you're in, you'll know. <laughs> so uh, also, this is more Air Force generic, but the quality of our travel 
is much better than every other service and their quality of life too. So, um, and if you don't know what that means, I'd say like when we travel, we typically will stay at a decent lodging or hotel or some, something of that sort rather than making our own tent in the field, which you do do during training time. But besides that, Air Force is the way to go. So I can't share all details with you about like the day to day of everything, but like at the Pentagon, um, I had a couple different jobs, I guess you could say. So one of them was like strategy where um, basically we helped with different policies that were coming through at the time. And a lot of it is uh, proper wording and your writing skills will get so refined in that position. And also um, being, a, being an executive assistant for a general, actually a very amazing general at that time. Um, yeah, so the experiences are just so priceless that you have. And um, I also did another assignment, which I mentioned earlier, being the ROTC instructor at San Diego State University. So that's um, not obviously not a communications or cyber job, but also that was one of the most fun jobs where going to work did not feel like work every single day. I just went because I loved it. And actually I went because I was obligated to go, but I didn't, I literally did not feel like it was work one bit. Let me check for some questions that I want to answer. I've actually been called to mentor lately, um, mostly young women um, who are looking at this sort of career field. Uh, okay, what does their day-to-day -day look like? I kind of addressed that already. What type of skills or experience translated to the role? Uh, there's so many, but um, you know, one interesting one that I never thought would have helped me was back when I was a uh, ROTC cadet at Sacramento State, I was doing an internship at a congressman's office. And um, actually I learned like office skills being there, being like 19 or so and learning like how to answer the phone and how to answer emails and just office etiquette. I felt that that actually helped me out so much when I first showed up to my first assignment. And actually a lot of other lieutenants did not really have that experience. Okay, so I realized I never said the cons of this career field. So let's go through a couple of those. A huge con with this career field is you can literally be left to like be forgotten in a random base communication squadron somewhere in the middle of nowhere, um, especially if you're like a lieutenant or something, you, you can feel forgotten, but you're not forgotten, trust me. Uh, but um, it, it can feel that way, but just know that it's it's temporary. Um, and you can, at that point, I actually felt that way for a bit when I was at Schreiber, and I would just literally apply for every single opportunity or um, I don't know, every course or uh, different TDYs that would come up. I just volunteered for literally everything. And um, actually at one point I was considering going the JAG uh, law school route. However, I ended up switching um, units and I ended up loving my job over there. So I decided to stick with communications and keep giving it a shot. And it has definitely treated me incredibly well. Another con is no windows. So like <laughs> uh, this, this goes with a lot of other career fields, but like be used to like no sunlight at times. Um, another thing is this career field can be kind of lonely in a weird way, uh, especially when you're like a younger officer, like a lieutenant, where um, like you have friends who become pilots and there's like, they all get to hang out with each other and there's so many of them. However, uh, when I first showed up to my first assignment, there were about 275 enlisted in our unit and just me and one other lieutenant who like we had nothing in common, so we weren't really even friends. <laughs> so I had to go outwards and it expand my social circle to make other friends. But the good thing with that is on the flip side, you have much more leadership opportunities than your peers, okay? So it's not all bad. So that's all I have for now. If you have any questions, please drop them below and I'll answer them as much as I possibly can. And then also um, hit subscribe and turn on that notification bell. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Kimchi Warrior Princess. All right, thanks everyone.